Hello, listeners. I'm your host, Amara, and this is Black Girl Gone, a true crime podcast. On this episode of Black Girl Gone, we tell the story of 24-year-old Brenwanda Smith, who disappeared from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on February 18, 1997. Brenwanda was working as a bus driver for the local transit authority and had just moved into her first apartment. The day she went missing, after completing her shift at around 1.30 p.m., she left the depot. But six hours later, Brenwanda came back. A co-worker who saw her offered her a ride, but Brenwanda said she was waiting for someone. Brenwanda never made it home, and no one ever saw her again. 25 years later, Brenwanda is still missing. What happened to Brenwanda? And who is responsible for her disappearance? This is Brenwanda's story. If you've been listening to the show, then you know that I often cover stories of the missing that are decades old. The obvious reason is because these women are still missing, and regardless of the outcome, their families deserve closure. The other reason is because at the time these women vanished, their stories didn't get the attention that they deserved. I'm from Philadelphia. I live 10 minutes from where Brenwanda's apartment was, and I've never heard about her story. Now, granted, it was 25 years ago, and in a crime-ridden city like this, it's very easy for a missing persons case to just be forgotten. But for me, Brenwanda's story stood out because she went missing from my city. A young 24-year-old woman with a good job living in a coveted suburb of Philadelphia just vanished. The families of all of these women, including Brenwanda's, are still searching for answers. They want to know what happened to their loved ones. Bernwanda Smith, who was affectionately known as Brenny to her family and friends, had grown up in the city of Philadelphia where she was raised by her parents, Karen and Henry Smith. The family lived in the Logan section of the city, which is a neighborhood in the northern part of the city. For those who are not from Philadelphia or not familiar with the city, then you may not know that Philadelphia is a city of neighborhoods. Every single area of the city has a name. It would literally take me a full episode to break down all the neighborhoods, but it's one of the things that makes Philly, Philly. After graduating from Central High School, Bernie continued to live at home with her parents, who she had a great relationship with. As she grew into adulthood, she remained close to both her mother and her father. After high school, Brenwanda tried out business school for a little while and worked several jobs at a bank. But in 1994, she got a job working for SEPTA, which is the Transportation Authority here in Philadelphia. Now, although our transit system isn't as large as, like, New York's, it's still pretty large, and thousands of Philadelphians rely on SEPTA. In the 90s especially, getting a job at SEPTA was a really good deal— It was a job that came with great benefits and was the kind of job that you could have for the rest of your life. Now, Brenny began working at SEPTA as what they called a hold-down operator. And the hold-down operator fills in for the regular drivers when someone is out of work for one reason or the other. According to those that work with Brenny at SEPTA, she was a hardworking employee. Her supervisors described her as an outstanding employee. She would work holidays and extra shifts, and she was always on time for work. Her parents said that Brenny began working long hours so that she could start to save money for her own place. I mean, despite having a really good relationship with her parents, Brenny was an adult, and so she wanted to live on her own. And so after saving up enough money, Brenny found an apartment in Sheltonham, PA. Now, Sheltonham is technically a suburb of Philadelphia, but it's a very close suburb. So close that one side of the street is Sheltonham and the other side is Philadelphia. Bernie had found a little apartment in the Linwood Garden Apartments, which consisted of both apartments and townhomes. 
And Linwood Gardens was directly across the street from the Sheltonham Mall, which I'm sure for Brenny, who loved fashion, was very convenient. Even though it wasn't a big place, it was perfect for Brenny, and her parents said that she was so excited to be living on her own. Although close in proximity, there's a big difference between living in Logan and living in Sheltonham. But being close to her parents gave Brenny the best of both worlds. In January 1997, Brenny moved into her apartment. At the time, Brenny didn't have a car, and her dad Henry said that he would often pick her up and drop her off at work. And on the days when Henry was unavailable, Brenny would just take SEPTA or she would catch a ride with coworkers. Brenny also would talk to her mom on the phone every single day. And even though her work schedule kept her really busy, she made sure to visit her parents often. She would even spend the night sometimes if she didn't have to work. On February 18th, 1997, Brenny was scheduled to work an early shift. That day, Brenny took the bus from her apartment in Sheltonham to the depot at 10th and Luzerne, which is now closed. But that day started off like any other day for Brenny, who at that point had been working for SEPTA for two years. That day, Brenny was going to be driving the C-Bus, which was the bus that traveled up and down Broad Street from Sheltonham Avenue, near where Brenny lived, to City Hall. Now, after starting off pretty uneventfully, a few hours into her shift, Brenny got into an accident. At around 11 a.m. near Broad and Gerard, Brenny and her bus had hit a car. It was a minor accident, and no one was hurt, but Brenny was really shaken up. It was the first time in two years since she started driving for SEPTA that she had gotten into an accident. Now, as part of SEPTA's policy, employees are not allowed to speak with the police at the scene of an accident until a supervisor arrives. But Brenny wasn't aware of the policy, and so when the police arrived at the scene of the accident, she spoke to them. But once Brenny found out that she had violated SEPTA's policy, it made a bad situation worse for her. Brenny called her parents from the scene and told them what had happened. Her parents recalled in an interview with the Philadelphia Inquirer that Brenny was inconsolable. Her parents tried to calm her down and tell her, you know, it had been her first accident. And up until that point, Brenny had had an excellent driving record. They reassured their daughter that, you know, everything would be okay. And her mom suggested that Maybe she should take a vacation. Brenny had been working nonstop, and her mom thought that maybe some time off would be good for her. Brenny told her parents that she would call them later that evening, but it was the last time that they ever spoke to Brenny. After the accident, Brenny had to return to the depot to fill out an incident report. And at around 1.30 p.m., after filling out the paperwork, Brenny left the depot. But... Where she went when she left is a big part of this mystery. However, at some point, her parents believed that she stopped by their house. They believed this because later that same evening when they arrived home, they found a trifold mirror that had been left on the bathroom sink. Now, Brenny would often use this mirror to look at her hair, and so it being left on the sink told them that she must have been there. However, There's no indication that anyone saw Brenny going in and out of her parents' house. And in fact, it was six and a half hours until anyone saw Brenny again that day. Now, after leaving the depot at around 1.30 p.m., Brenny was seen back there at around 7 p.m. Now, a couple of co-workers of Brenny's saw her near the depot at Old York and Luzerne, walking towards the bus that she would have normally taken to go home. They said they stopped and asked her if she needed a ride, but she declined and told them that she was actually waiting for someone to pick her up. But it was the last time that anyone would see Brittany. That night, after not hearing from their daughter, Brittany's parents began calling her to check on her, but their calls were going unanswered. Now, the fact that Brenny wasn't answering the phone wasn't immediately concerning for the couple. I mean, they figured after the day that Brenny had had, maybe she had just went home and went to sleep. But when the next day came and she was still not answering their calls and hadn't called them back, they began to worry. 
Karen, Bernie's mom, reached out to Bernie's cousin, Cynthia, to see if she had heard from her and to let her know that they could not get a hold of Bernie. Cynthia and Bernie had been more like sisters. Cynthia told the Philadelphia Inquirer that Bernie was like the younger sister that she never had. She had even been the maid of honor in Cynthia's wedding. So when Cynthia got word from her parents that they hadn't spoken to her, she knew that something was wrong. Now, in 1997, pagers were still a thing, and Cynthia and Brenny would often page each other 911 when one needed the other to call them immediately. And so Cynthia paged Brenny 911 several times, but Brenny was not calling her back. And when Brenny did not respond to the 911 page, her parents and Cynthia knew that something was really wrong. Brenny would not have gone this long without contacting her family especially her parents, who she spoke to every day. And after two days went by with no word from Brenny, her parents decided to go over to their daughter's apartment to see if she was there. Fortunately for her parents, Brenny had given them a spare key, so they would be able to enter the apartment once they got there. Now, when Brenny's parents arrived at her apartment, they knocked on the door, but it was obvious that Brenny was not there. So they used their key to enter the apartment. And despite the pristine condition of the apartment, Karen and Henry knew something wasn't right. For one, the apartment was completely dark, and Brenny would always leave a light on when she left so she wouldn't come home to a dark apartment. But there was also no sign of Brenny, and nothing to indicate that she had been in the apartment recently. Nothing was out of place, and nothing appeared to be missing, but the bed was still made. Now, finding Brenny's apartment empty with no sign of her turned her parents' worry into dread. After not finding Brenny at her apartment, her parents decided to go to the depot on Luzerne, where Brenny had last worked. Maybe she had decided to pick up some extra shifts and had just been working those past two days. But when they arrived at the depot... One of the SEPTA employees told them that Bernie was out sick and was scheduled to return to work on Saturday. Now, her parents, of course, knew nothing about her calling out sick. And if she was sick, well, where was she now? It's not clear if her parents got any information about when she called out sick, but none of it was making any sense. All Bernie's parents knew at that time was that Bernie was missing and that she would have not just walked away on her own. Her father told the inquirer that Brenny was a responsible, considerate person who wouldn't just disappear and wouldn't just walk away from her responsibilities. Brenny was scheduled to work that Saturday, according to SEPTA. But Saturday came, and Brenny didn't show up for work. After two years, Brenny had never not shown up for work for her shift— and when Karen and Henry found out that Brenny didn't show up for work, they contacted the police. On February 22nd, almost four days after Brenny was last seen, her parents reported her missing. Since Brenny was living in Sheltonham at the time, the Sheltonham police joined the Philadelphia police in the investigation, although it appears as if eventually Sheltonham took over the investigation as the lead agency. Once the police began investigating, they spoke to Brenny's family and friends, and it was pretty clear that they were not dealing with a case of someone just leaving on their own. Everyone they spoke to said the same thing about Brenny. She was responsible, she had no enemies, and no reason to willingly walk away from her life. So where was she? Did someone pick Brenny up that night? And... If so, her family and detectives on the case were left with very few clues about who. But a few months before she disappeared, Prenny had a chance encounter with a fellow employee who years later would become a convicted serial killer. Is he the person responsible for her disappearance? You want to know the key to consistent good hair days? Using ingredients that benefit your hair. 
Function of Beauty makes hair care products that are 100% customizable, made for your hair where it's at now and where you want it to go. Your hair is completely unique, and products that address its specific needs, that's where Function of Beauty comes in. So I wear a lot of wigs. If you know, you know. Part of the reason is because I'm lazy and wigs are easy, but the other reason is because my hair gets really dry and starts to break off. But a few months ago, I started using Function of Beauty and it's a game changer. I took the quiz about my hair goals and started using my shampoo and conditioner and I've seen a huge difference in my hair. I still like a good wig, but now I can achieve my hair goals while wearing them. Function of Beauty is the world's first fully customizable hair care that creates individually filled shampoos, conditioners, styling, and treatment formulas based on your hair now and where you want it to go. Founded by a dream team of engineers and cosmetic scientists, each Function of Beauty product is individually designed to be as unique as you are. Function of Beauty offers over 54 trillion possible formulations. Every one of them is vegan and cruelty-free and they never use sulfates or parabens. You can also go completely silicone free. Here's how it works. First, take the quick hair quiz to build your hair profile and select five hair goals, like lengthen, volumize, and oil control. Does your hair get frizzy in the winter, but oily in the summer? Function formulations are meant to be changed when your hair needs change. Next, choose your color and fragrance, or go dye or fragrance-free. Then, get your freshly filled formula delivered straight to your door and prepare for good hair days ahead. Say goodbye to genetic hair care for good today. Go to functionofbeauty.com slash girlgone to take your hair goal quiz and you'll save 25% on your first order. Go to functionofbeauty.com slash girlgone to let them know you heard about it from our show and to get 25% off your first order. That's functionofbeauty.com slash girlgone to take your hair quiz and save 25% on your first order. Free people. Fashion. <laughs> Unique pieces. Have your own kind of style. Wear more colorful stuff. Black t-shirts. <laughs> I love creating my own look. Hip, sexy, vintage. How do I top that? It's just like not so cool to look the same all the time. Leather, leather all the way. Comfy, <laughs> casual. A pair of big old baggy, light wash, blue jeans. Creativity, inspiration. Free people. Free people. Free people. <laughs> On February 18, 1997, 34-year-old Brenwanda Brenny Smith left the Luzerne Bus Depot on 10th and Luzerne in Philadelphia at around 1.30 p.m. Six hours later, she was again seen near the depot. Her co-workers who saw her walking towards the bus depot offered her a ride home. But Brenny told them that she had a ride. And no one ever saw Brenny again. Four days after she was last seen, her parents reported her missing. And as police began their investigation into what happened, it wouldn't be long before they concluded that Brenny likely wasn't missing on her own. When the police received reports of Brenny missing, they began their investigation by trying to trace her last movements. They spoke to co-workers and employees of SEPTA at the Luzerne Depot and learned about the last two sightings of Brenny, including the final one at 7 p.m. They also went to Brenny's apartment to see if they could find any clues there. But like Brenny's parents, they found that the apartment was immaculate. There was no sign of a struggle or any sign that Brenny had left in a hurry. All of her clothing and jewelry was also inside. After looking through her apartment, investigators also did not believe that Brenny had ever made it back to her apartment. And her answering machine was full of calls from family and friends who had been trying to reach her for days. After searching her apartment and speaking to her co-workers, investigators had some idea of the last time that Brenny was seen. But there was information that they were never able to figure out, like where Brenny was between the hours of 1.30 and 7, 
And why, after completing her shift, did she come all the way back to the depot? I mean, maybe she had forgotten something and went back to get it. But the other question was, who had Brenny been waiting for? Whoever this person was never came forward to say they picked Brenny up or were supposed to pick Brenny up. So whoever that person is remains a mystery. Without social media, Brenny's family had to hit the pavement and pass out flyers. The local paper, the Philadelphia Inquirer, ran a few stories about Brenny's disappearance, but there were never any formal searches organized by police. Despite their desperation and fear, Brenny's parents remained hopeful that she would be found alive. Her family organized rallies at the place where she was last seen, and a $1,000 reward was offered for information about Brenny's disappearance. However, despite her family's best efforts, police were unable to find any credible information about what happened to Brenny. Investigators continuously hit a brick wall. To them, it appeared like Brenny had vanished into thin air. One of the detectives working the case said that in his 25 years of experience, he had never encountered a case like this, where it seemed like the person had, quote, disappeared off the face of the earth for no reason. But we all know that Brenny didn't disappear off the face of the earth because people don't disappear. Something happens to them, either by choice or by force. As the months went by, the frustration around the lack of information about Brenny's disappearance grew for both Brenny's family and investigators on the case. But without evidence, investigators couldn't say whether or not a crime had even been committed. Someone simply missing is not a crime. And with no direct evidence of foul play, Brenny's case remained a missing persons case. 11 months after her disappearance, Investigators spoke to the Inquirer and said that despite Brenny's case being entered into the national databases, they had only received a few calls, and all of those leads had run cold. We don't know what we're suspecting, one of the investigators told the Inquirer. We don't know if a crime has been committed. Anybody can have a theory, but we have nothing to substantiate it. There's a very deep concern that this may not have a happy ending. In their interview, police would only say that they had interviewed several people and that the names of potential suspects would not be revealed. They said that they continued to monitor Brenny's credit cards and bank account, but other than a withdrawal from an ATM for an undisclosed amount of money on the day that she disappeared, there had been no activity on any of her accounts. The reality was bleak. Investigators had no information. And as the one-year mark approached, Brenny's case was becoming cold. After the article featuring Brenny's story in 1998, there were very few mentions of Brenny or her case over the next several years. Aside from a blurb here and there about cold cases in the city, what happened to Brenny and her investigation did not appear in any searches. Brenny's family did their best to keep attention on her case, but one year became two years, and the answers that they were hoping to find seemed to be less and less likely. But in 2005, a brutal murder in Center City, Philadelphia, brought a glimmer of hope that Brenny's family might get answers because the killer had a connection to Brenny. In the early morning hours of May 17, 2005, 48-year-old Patricia McDermott got off a SEPTA bus at 9th and Market in Center City, which is downtown Philadelphia, to walk to her job at Pennsylvania Hospital, where she worked as an x-ray tech. It was part of her normal routine. She would get off near the post office and walk the short distance to the hospital. Even in a city that is plagued by violence in almost every corner— Center City, especially at that time, was one of the safest parts of the city. Now, shortly before 5 a.m., surveillance footage captured Patricia getting off the 33 bus. And on that footage, you can see Patricia exit the bus along with a second person. 
As Patricia began to make her way to the hospital, the person who got off the bus at the same time began following not far behind her. A second surveillance camera captured both Patricia and the second person as they came around a corner. Patricia never seemed to notice the person following behind her. But suddenly, without provocation, the person following Patricia raised his arm and shot Patricia, point blank in the back of the head, killing her. Patricia's senseless murder sent shockwaves to the city. A woman, a mother, being murdered for seemingly no reason in Center City while she was on her way to work terrified people in the city. Now, as sad as it sounds, Philadelphians are used to a certain kind of violence in certain areas of the city. And when gun violence seeps into nice neighborhoods and affects people not perceived as your typical victim, people get nervous because, in reality, Patricia really could have been anybody. The victim, the location, the pure heinousness of the murder, and the fact that it had been captured on camera made solving Patricia's murder a priority. Now, after weeks of searching cameras in the area and going door to door, police received a break in Patricia's murder. Someone called police and said that he believed that he could identify the person seen in the surveillance footage that night following Patricia. The caller told police that the figure resembled a man who was a regular on the 33 bus named Juan Covington. Like Patricia, Juan was often seen riding the 33 bus, but he also had another connection to Patricia. Juan also worked at Pennsylvania Hospital. Armed with the information, police retrieved surveillance footage from the hospital from the morning of the murder. And on that footage, they saw the same man who killed Patricia entering the hospital an hour and a half after Patricia's murder, wearing the same hat and the same jacket. It was Juan Covington. And when Juan was shown the footage, he confessed to the murder of Patricia McDermott. But when Juan was arrested, investigators had no idea that Patricia was not Juan's first victim she was his last. After Juan Covington was arrested, he confessed to killing a man two months before Patricia in a subway station. And in 2003 and 2004, he shot two different men. Both were shot nine times, but miraculously survived. He also confessed to killing his cousin, who was a local reverend in 1998. He killed him while he was leading a prayer service. Juan Covington was a serial killer. He had been murdering people in the city for almost a decade. And the only reason why he was caught was because of their surveillance footage. But how was Juan Covington connected to Brenny? Well, it's not clear at what point investigators learned of the possible connection. But the first mention of it wasn't until 2005 when Juan was arrested for the other murders. But prior to working at the hospital, Juan Covington spent 18 years working for SEPTA. He worked there until 2001 when he was fired. But a few months before Brenny disappeared, her co-workers told police that Brenny had gotten into a heated argument with Covington. Apparently, Covington had been flirting with Brenny and had asked her out a few times, but Brenny had been rejecting his advances. Now, it's not clear what Brenny and Covington were arguing about, but it's believed it had something to do with her rejecting him. Now, Covington's defense attorney claimed that he was schizophrenic and had been on and off his medication for years. The connection to a now-convicted serial killer wasn't lost on detectives or Brenny's family. Brenny was seen arguing with a man who, less than 10 years after her disappearance, would be arrested for and confessed to multiple murders spanning years. There was a strong possibility that Covington may have been involved in what happened to Brenny, but there wasn't any actual evidence to support that theory. No one had seen Covington with Brenny the night that she vanished, And Covington, despite confessing to the other murders and attempted murders, had denied any involvement in what happened to Brenny. 
Ron Covington did plead guilty, and he was sentenced to three life sentences in 2007. The only motive police have ever found for Covington's killing spree was that these people had been in his way. With the exception of his cousin, Covington had no relationship with his victims. And despite the promising lead about his connection to Brenny, police have never been able to connect him to Brenny's disappearance. It's now been 25 years since Bernwanda was last seen. And the more time that goes by, the less hopeful detectives have become that they will ever find out what happened to her. After all this time, Bernwanda's family and friends just want to know what happened. 25 years is a long time. Too long. The one thing about Philadelphia is everybody knows everybody. In Philadelphia, six degrees of separation is more like one degree of separation. I always say someone knows something when it comes to the cases of the missing and unsolved murders. But being from this city, I know for a fact that somebody knows something. Even 25 years later, there's someone out there that remembers. You could be the one that brings this family closure and leads investigators to finding out exactly what happened to Bernwanda. Bernwanda Smith disappeared from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on February 18th, 1997. She was last seen in the Hunting Park section of the city near Old York Road and Luzerne Avenue at around 7 p.m. She was last seen wearing her SEPTA uniform. If you have any information about Brenwanda Smith or the circumstances of her disappearance, please call the Sheltonham, Pennsylvania Police Department. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Make sure you subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. It also helps our show grow. As always, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook. 